Okay, this is the Physics 12 lesson on conservation of momentum. Okay, so in our previous lesson, we looked at defining momentum, impulse, and then looked at the impulse momentum theory, or theorem, sorry, so the connection between the two and how they're very much related uh, to each other. So what we look at now is uh, just discussing the conservation of momentum. Okay, so uh, conservation of momentum essentially comes from uh, Newton's third law, which is stating that for every action force on object B due to object A, there is a reaction force equal in magnitude but opposite in direction acting on object A due to object B. You may have heard this more uh, eloquently stated, just like for every action there's an equal but opposite reaction, right? Something like that, okay? Um, so when we talk about this and apply it to momentum, it actually gives us uh, one of the very important laws, right? So this, and that is the law of conservation of momentum, okay? So again, uh, just as a reminder, this is one of those things where I want you to be keeping that vocabulary journal of everything that we're learning about. Uh, so you had a few from your impulse momentum theory uh, slide, so this would be your next one, right? Anything that's bold and underlined, that should be going in your definition journal. So here we go. So again, so your law of conservation of momentum states that the sum of the momenta of two objects prior to a collision is equal to the sum of their momenta after they collide. Okay, so relatively straightforward. If you can figure out the momentum of each of the individual objects before a collision and then you can figure out the momentum afterwards, it's going to equal. There's no momentum lost in that scenario. Okay. Um, and again, what that kind of comes down to is just defining your internal versus your external force. Okay, so your internal force is any force exerted on an object in the system due to another object in the system. So in the case of just like a collision, like you saw in there in like the car crash, right? Um, those are two objects already within the system, right? So them impacting each other, those are internal forces, right? External forces, however, are any force exerted by an object that is not part of a system uh, on an object within the system. So you can kind of think of that as like a, an outward applied force that's happening, like you know, you've got other objects happening uh, and then something else is, that wasn't defined as part of the system comes in and, and pushes it or applies a force to it, and that would be considered an external force. Okay, so uh, internal forces essentially, they will not uh, contribute to the change in the total momentum, which means that you're going to get that conservation. Okay. Um, so again, another example that you could have uh, there is that if you've got two hockey pucks sliding towards each other and they bump one another, in that particular system, we're only concerned with the hockey pucks and everything else is external, right? So we've defined our system here as the hockey pucks sliding uh, towards each other, right? So in that particular example, force of gravity is an external force, right? It's a force that um, is acting upon our pucks but it has no bearing on what we're actually dealing with in terms of the, the system being the pucks moving together, right? But however, a force that does affect that particular system is the force of friction because that does affect uh, their their motion right towards each other. Okay, so you can just kind of look at you know look at how a problem is framed to determine what are your internal and your external forces, uh, and you know again making sure that everything is the way that it should be in terms of everything being preserved within the system itself. Okay, so again when we talk about those types of systems you can have, so a system in general is defined as any group of objects that are interacting with one another. Okay, so there's your broad definition of it. You've got what we consider an open system, where in an open system you can change, uh, an open system can exchange matter and energy with its surroundings. Okay, so essentially matter can be brought in, matter can be brought out, right? Energy can be lost, energy can be gained if you're dealing with an open system. Okay, with a closed system, Okay, uh, your matter isn't going to leave or enter, but your energy might, right? So you might have a closed system, but you can still have a loss of energy through uh, heat, right? And in an isolated system, nothing leaves and nothing enters, okay? So it's kind of your, this is your ideal situation there, right? Where everything is 100% preserved, right? So just as a kind of general example there, if you thought about, uh, you know, boiling potatoes on an open, uh, an open stove and just an open pot, that would be considered an open system, right? Because you can have like an actual leaving of matter here, right? The water can evaporate and then actually leave that system there, right? So that would be considered open. This would be closed, right? So if you're boiling stuff in like a, a closed lid pot, 
okay? Um, that's like sealed, right? So maybe think like an Instaplot or something like that, right? That would be a closed system um, in the sense that, yeah, no matter is getting out, right? Any evaporation is just going to uh, condense here on the lid and then drop back in the system. However, what is going to happen is that that pot's still going to get very hot. It's going to be giving off heat, right? So heat can still leave. So that would be considered a closed system. So there's no exchange of matter, but there is an exchange of energy. And then if you were to think of this in terms of like an isolated system and thinking about, you know, doing your boiling pot of potatoes, but inside a particular cooler, let's say, right? Inside that cooler itself is an isolated system because you're not having any sort of, um, like even no heat is given off, right? Because you're, you've insulated the system, okay? So that's just kind of an example of what we talked about when we're talking about different types of systems, okay? So when we kind of go back to that, you know, that big law of conservation and momentum, right? It does obviously have a, a mathematical aspect to it, right? Where what we're saying is that the sum of the momentum before the collision is equal to the sum of the momentum after the collision. All right, so again, if you look at how we've defined uh, momentum in our previous slides, right, it's the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So if we, in this case, if we have a two-object system, right, uh, it's the mass of the first object, of course, in kilograms, multiplied by its velocity, measured in meters per second, and this is the before the collision, right? And then, again, mass of the second object multiplied its, by its velocity. And then over here, you see the same kind of things, except you see that little you know, what looks like an apostrophe, like the prime, right? So the mass, I, you know, isn't really going to change in this situation, right? The mass of our objects aren't going to change. However, their velocities will. All right, so these velocities are velocities before a collision, and these are velocities uh, after the collision, okay? So the prime is just representing the afterwards, right? And so that's, you know, that law of conservation momentum can then be used to find missing velocities um, or even potentially missing masses, uh, from a, a given situation. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, just, you know, these ones should, they might be reviewed for many of you. But again, I've learned that a quick little review example goes a long way in making sure that we're all on the same page. Right, so uh, we'll look at that one dimensional collision sample problem. Okay, so if you have a 1.75 times 10 to the 4 kilogram boxcar rolling down a track toward a stationary boxcar, that has a mass of 2.00 times 10 to the 4 kilograms, right? That's our scenario of what's happening. Uh, just before the collision, the first boxcar is moving east at 5.45 meters per second. When the boxcars collide, they lock together and continue down the track. What is the velocity of the two boxcars immediately after the collision? Okay, so let's take a look at solving that particular problem together right, using the law of conservation of momentum. Okay, so things that we have. We have two masses, right, two boxcars. So we have the mass of boxcar A, right, the first one, which was that value of 1.75 times 10 to the 4 kilogram. We also have the mass of the second boxcar, which was 2.00 times uh, 10 to the 4 kilograms. We had the initial velocity of the first boxcar, right? So the velocity of the, the one that's rolling down the track was just before the collision at 5.45 meters per second in eastern direction. And it was colliding with a stationary boxcar, meaning the initial velocity of that second one was zero, okay? What's happening in this scenario is that because the boxcars are locking up and then moving together, whatever the velocity is of the first boxcar after the collision is going to be equal to whatever the velocity is of the second boxcar, right? Because they're moving now together, okay? So they'll have the same velocity. So that's our unknown that we're solving for, and I'm just gonna call that x in our particular mathematical solving here, right? So if we set up our law of conservation momentum formula, right, so our ma ba plus mb bb is equal to ma ba prime plus mb bb prime, okay? We can start putting in our values. Right? So we have both of these values here, right? So that's going to be our 1.75 times 10 to the 4 kilograms 
multiplied by our 5.45 meters per second, right? This entire term is actually going to turn into nothing, right? Because what you're going to do, you're going to take your mass of 2.00 times 10 to the 4, and you're going to multiply it by 0. So this whole thing is just going to be gone, right? So that's going to be 0. And then here, we have the mass of our first boxcar, that 1.75 times 10 to the 4. This value we don't know, but if we call it x, we're good there, right? And then we have the second boxcar mass here, so plus that value of the 2.00 times 10 to the 4, again, multiplied by x. Right? So because these are the same values and they're both multiplied by x, these are now kind of like terms that can be combined and added together. So what you end up getting here, you do this multiplication, and what you get is a value of 95,375 kilogram meters per second is equal to, right, so you're going to add these two values and get a value of 3.75 times 10 to the 4 times x, okay? And now what you'd be doing, and again, this would be a mass and then a mass, so that's, that's kilograms there, okay? So then what you can do is to solve for x, you divide both sides by that 3.75 times 10 to the 4, so we divide that side, right, 95,375 divided by 3.75 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. Your kilograms will end up canceling, and you end up getting a value here of 2.54 meters per second is equal to x. Okay, so there's our velocity, and again, because the other one was stationary and they locked together and keep moving, uh, this is going to be in that same direction of East, right? So we see that after the collision, the first boxcar definitely loses some velocity, right? However, what uh, the, the second boxcar is able to kind of pick up some velocity there as well, right? Because now it's a bigger mass that's moving along down the line, okay? So there's our first example. Okay, so we go back. All right, again, there's the, the typed out solution, so you don't have to rewatch the video if you're looking for the solution. Uh, they kind of do the rearrangement of the formula first. I just kind of solved it as is, uh, but that works for you as well. Okay. Um, the other thing that we want to talk about is the idea of recoil. Okay, so in that first example, your objects locked together and then just kept going. Okay, that doesn't always happen, obviously. And what could happen instead is you could get uh, recoil. Okay, and this is going to come down to whether this whether a collision is elastic or inelastic, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail in another lesson. Okay, but uh, when we talk about recoil, we're talking about the interaction that occurs when two stationary objects push against each other and then move apart. Okay, so instead of um, you know something you know hitting and then you know them locking up and going together, you're instead kind of getting a collision and they move in opposite directions, right? So in that recoil, what you get is the interaction with two stationary objects are going to push uh, against each other and then move apart, right? So you might think of a recoil of like when you, you may not have shot a gun before, right? But it's like it, it recoils against your shoulder, right? So let's, you know, another example there, okay? So another example here of recoil, so you and your friend are standing in a canoe and you need to switch places, okay? The canoe is not moving on the water, right? So it's a stationary object, right? And you're, you and your friend are also stationary. You were just sitting there or standing, right? And then you get up and you start to take a step, right? But as you step kind of one direction, you kind of feel like the boat has moved as well and in the opposite direction, right? Because essentially what's happened is that you and your friend in the canoe, you formed a system. And when you move, your foot has pushed against the bottom of the canoe, and as a result, you gain momentum through your velocity, right? Because your mass now has a velocity, so now you can calculate a momentum there, because you're moving. And if you're going to be moving, in order for that conservation momentum to be preserved within the system, so does the canoe, right? You've started moving, so now you've given the other stationary object, the canoe, and your friend also movement, and it will be movement in the opposite direction, right? Going back to uh, Newton's third law there, right? So again, so since that law, the momentum of the system is conserved, right, the canoe is going to start to moving, and it's going to start to move in the opposite direction, right? So in that recoil, you're moving in the opposite direction versus in that first example where we end up seeing uh, like a collision that ends up pushing all of them the same. Okay, uh, so 
let's look at that sample problem. So using that exact example, right, let's start getting some values associated with that. But uh, for the case described, right, uh, find the velocity of the canoe and your friend, right, so the other part of the system. Um, at the instant you start to take a step, if your velocity is 0.75 meters per second in a forward direction, uh, and assuming that your mass is 65 kilograms and that the combined mass of the canoe and your friend is 115 kilograms. So that's the other section of the system. Okay, so let's do that together. Okay, so in a scenario like this with Requo, what's happening is like you have two of these kind of stationary objects, right? There's you and I guess this, I guess the way I'm going to draw this is kind of like, well, this is you and this is you and your friend in the canoe. Right now you're stationary, you're just sitting there, right? What ends up happening is that you decide to take a step forward. And when you do, the boat and your friend move in the opposite direction, right? Or if this is you, you've moved that way and then the canoe and your friend have started moving that way, right? That's what's happening. And that's scenario, they're pushing against each other and going in opposite directions. So if we assign your mass, right, the person moving, uh, that's been given to us as 65 kilograms, okay? Uh, we know that the initial velocity, right, at the beginning of this system, in the starting system, you weren't moving at all, right? Your initial velocity was actually zero. You were all just sitting nicely in the boat, right? So your mass was 65 kilo, uh, kilograms and you weren't moving and the mass of the canoe and your friend being 115 kilograms were also not moving. Right, so that whole left side of that equation of conservation momentum is just gone, right? Because it would be momentum of you is nothing, momentum of your friend in the boat is nothing, but what happens afterwards is that you start moving with a velocity of 0 0.75 meters per second forward. Right? And what we're trying to find is, okay, well then what happens with the velocity of the canoe and your friend? Right? That's what we're trying to solve for. So let's actually just call that x. Right? That's the thing we're trying to find. So again, like I said, if we were to set up that conservation momentum formula, Okay, so if we set that up, like I said, plugging these values in, that's gone, right? Because you're going to get 65 times 0, that's 0. This will also be gone. It's 115 times 0, so it's also 0. This is the thing that we're solving for, so might as well just take that entire thing and bring it over to the other side of the equation, and what you get is negative mb vb prime is equal to ma va prime. Right now, you can solve for that velocity by dividing both sides by negative mb. Right, so there should have arrows, but you get my point. Right, so your velocity of the your friend and the canoe is equal to the mass of you times the velocity of you after you start moving divided by negative mass of the other people. Right, so once we have that formula, we can start plugging in those values. wouldn't give for a bigger whiteboard. All right, so our mass of A, right, that's mass of U, which is your 65, multiplied by your after velocity, which was that value of 0 0.75 meters per second, divided by the negative mass of B, which was the boat and your friend combined, which was 115. And in doing that calculation, what you end up with is a value of negative 0 0.42 meters per second, right? And again, this makes sense that this is negative because we are dealing with that opposite reaction because if this uh, initial velocity here was in a forward direction, we can call it positive, this is in a negative direction, right? So we could either just call it negative 0 0.42 meters per second, or we could call it, uh, you know, 0 0.42 meters per second backward, right? The opposite of forwards, okay?
So there's that example there again using conservation of momentum. Okay, so again, uh, that's kind of that same setup there, right, of how you'd start setting up that problem, right, uh, which we already did, right, showing you that, uh, you know, you're stationary, nobody's moving, and then people start moving. And then again, there's the full solutions for people who can't watch the video and are just looking at the slides. Uh, that's there. And again, you get the same value. Okay. All right. Uh, for this one, though, we're going to run through this last one together again. Uh, your independent practice is really just your, your worksheets or your textbook questions, whichever I assign uh, for each lesson. So we will, if you want, you can pause this, try this, and then run through it. Uh, but if you're just happy to kind of see this whole lesson again, or this whole example, then by all means, just keep letting her play. Okay. So in this particular example, uh, while you're wearing inline skates, right, so roller skates essentially, you are standing still and holding a 1.7 kilogram rock. Why? I don't know, but you are. Okay. Assume that your mass is 57 kilograms. And if you throw the rock directly west with a velocity of 3.8 meters per second, what will be your recoil velocity? Right. So again, this is a scenario where it's recoiled because it was two stationary objects, right, and then motion was, you know, they exerted a motion onto, or onto each other, right? So they start moving uh, due to forces applied to each other, and then we get recoil. Okay, so we're basically asking for the recoil velocity of, well, in what direction do you move? You've thrown the rock with the velocity of 3.8 meters per second to the west. Automatically, we should know our answer is going to be going to the east because we're going to move in the opposite direction. Uh, the question just becomes, with what speed? Okay, so let's go through this one again. And this is our last one before we sign off. Okay, so what we're dealing with again is we have two separate masses, right? And they are essentially, you know, kind of kind of on top of each other, but it's like you've got mass one and then mass two, right? You're part of the same thing, right? But that first mass is the mass of you, which was the 57 kilograms. The second mass was the mass of the rock, which they tell us is 1.7 kilograms. We know that we are standing still, so our initial velocities for both are zeros. And we know that the mass of the rock, or it's not, not the mass, but the velocity of the rock after it's, you know, the action's been applied, is 3.8 meters per second to the west, and we are interested, well, well, then what's your recoil velocity, all right? What are we, we're solving for VA prime here, okay? So in doing that again, we can set up that law of conservation of momentum, right? So this is our MA, VA plus MB, BB is equal to MA, VA prime plus MB, BB prime. Once again, our initial velocities here are zeros, so gone and gone, thanks to multiplication by zero. We are interested in this value here, okay? So again, I can take that entire term and move it over, and what I get is negative MA VA prime is equal to MB VB prime, divide both sides by negative MA, Right, and then we start putting in those values, right? So that means our recoil velocity is going to equal 1.7 kilograms multiplied by 3.8 meters per second divided by negative your mass of 57 kilograms, okay? And when you do this, you do get a value of uh, zero, negative 0 0.11, right? So, I mean, you can do this two ways. You can either say, okay, this is 3.8 meters per second in a western direction, so anything that comes out negative means it's going in the opposite direction, so it would be east, or you can go back here and say, wait a minute, if I'm going west, that's really negative, and call this a negative value in here, right? Which then gives you a negative divided by a negative, giving you a positive value of 0.11 meters per second, and the fact that it's implied as positive would indicate 
of uh, eastern direction, right? Just kind of using like standard rules for, you know, directions and north, south, east, west kind of thing. Okay, uh, but there you go, right? And again, two sig fix, so 0.11 meters per second is your recoil velocity in this scenario. All right, so a couple little examples there, and what I've got posted is uh, just a worksheet on one-dimensional collisions and recoil, right? So similar to what we've just been doing, depending on the situation, what you need to solve for, okay? Um, so that's your next thing, and then don't forget to have been taking your definitions, okay? And then after that, our, here's my sheet, our next lesson is then we're gonna move on to collisions in two dimensions, okay? So that'll be your next video uh, that's coming up is collisions in two dimensions, and then we'll talk about elastic and inelastic collisions and have some assignments and then talk about explosions and all that good stuff. Okay, so that's what you're working on next, one-dimensional collisions and recoil worksheets. Again, full solutions will be posted. If there's any issues, let me know. And we can schedule a time to meet up or we can just chat via email. All right.